Issue 272 Reboot We start out with Sonic taking a swap bot so that its head springs off, and Antron's successful with a sword against another one, while Chip watches. I wish we saw a text box telling us where they were in the first panel, but it's safe to assume they're in Apatos. If they're gonna be dealing with the robots so easily that just one hit kills, I don't see what the point of showing this was other than padding, because it's not a real action scene, it's not exciting at all, and they're just in one place. In an unnecessary looking panel, Antoine complains about all the badniks, and Sonic says that he tangled with a few before he ran to Silver, right after they wrapped up another mission. And when I first read this story, this was the point where I was forced to stop reading and go read Sonic Super Special Magazine 14 to know what he was talking about. I didn't read it first because it wasn't on my timeline, so that broke me out of the story for days by referencing a story I can't even see when I just wanted to go through it. This panel didn't even need to exist. Chip Anx is lampshading they hasn't done anything to help, while the heroes have, and Sonic wastes our time cheering him up. And after he gets some ice cream, a whole bunch of our time is wasted because we're shown Knuckles recapping to the heroes that he shattered the Master's Emerald. That was boring. Everything about the story has been boring so far. Amy says that the Mystic Melody can be used to help find the Master Emerald shards too. If Knuckles can only sense shards that are a few miles away, that just makes it incredibly forced and convenient that he was able to find all the shards so quickly every other time, instead of it taking the span of multiple games to do it once. How did he find them all in just the course of SE2? Weren't they scattered around the whole planet? Like one was in Egypt and the other was on island. Plus, Amy should be saying she's been using it to narrow the search for emeralds as well as guide temples, which she hasn't looked for once so far. Can the plot actually progress? Obviously, the story should have started here. Rota says that they need to care about fixing the whole planet, so they can't divide themselves up or go flying everywhere while the world suffers when Amy's their best chance of finding the temples. And of course, Bonnie and Cream argue with him with pure emotion because they're idiots. Having Rotor be genuinely smart is good, but what ends up just making everyone arguing with him idiots, it's way too frustrating to be worth it. I always assumed that when I got to these pragmatic moments of his, all of his friends would allow him to get his way and do what he wants, because he's obviously smarter than them. So he obviously knows what he's talking about. In real life, smart people don't get that respect all the time. And who the fuck wants to be reminded of that in a Sonic comic? Of course I'm frustrated, the story's boring. No new settings, and the pacing's slow as shit. Speaking of idiot moments, even though the Apatos Guy Temple Guardian sent for Sonic, he just tells him there's no services scheduled for tonight. As if it's actually being used as a freaking church in a Sonic comic. I definitely prefer the idea that the Guy Temples are just buildings where you can put an emerald in to fix the planet. Because that keeps it simple and the building small. My point is, why the hell doesn't this guy recognize Sonic? Once again, I'm annoyed by Chip being called The Light Gaia. The old man's only reaction to being shown like Gaia in person is to say that Sonic's truly the hero he says he is. Relic had a more realistic reaction when he meant to call. I mean, she. It's so obvious she should have been pink or purple. The old man opens the door and shows him the guy gate right away. They didn't have to do Hub World bullshit where they talk to people in the town. This is amazingly fast paced. If nothing interesting was going to happen with the heroes on the way to the temple, we shouldn't have even had our time wasted with them outside in Aptos at all. Now watch as Sonic will not do the common sense thing and instantly run away to get the Chaos Emerald he had and come back and put it in. I don't know why he's just listening to this old man talk about stuff that's blatantly obvious. The old man says that the inner chambers of the temple are locked to all intruders. Antoine's response is that that's good because Eggman can't use them. First of all, they're also under the assumption that Eggman wants to fix the world. I'll never understand why these so-called heroes aren't happy about that and showing him appreciation and trying to help. What else would he use them for? No wonder he changed his mind. They'd interpret any good deed he'd do as evil. He could open a charity and they'd get angry. If Eggman was able to use the chambers now, he'd be able to put dangerous robots in there to discourage the heroes from fixing the world and depriving him of dark eye energy. Which he doesn't even need. I don't know why he can't just only guard one temple. He'd still have access as long as one temple wasn't activated. And he'd be more effective if he put all the temple guarding robots in one place. And third, what makes Antoine think Eggman can't enter the inner chambers? I'm pretty sure if he discovered a Gaia temple, 
He'd be able to blast his way past a locked door from ancient times and get into any room he wants. He's got lasers and giant robots. How stupid is he? This comic has no self-awareness. The old man says that these chambers can only be opened with a sun and moon keys, which have been entrusted to select families that keep their duty a secret. Why? This is a temple specifically built to fix the shattered planet. I see absolutely no reason why there'd be anything like this to delay the fixing of the planet. I do like the idea of moon and sun keys instead of silly video game medals, because they open a door. But there's no logic to this at all. How could the ancient people who made these temples have possibly anticipated that anyone in the future would want to prevent the world from being fixed? And Etchuan complains that this is bad because now they have to search for keys and temples. Flynn, if you knew this was bad, don't write it! He's a Sonic fan. He must have known that everyone hated the sun and moon medals for being extremely obvious, arbitrary padding. And it's going to irritate his audience anyways. There is a reason that I always assumed that once the heroes would find a temple, all they'd have to do is put the emerald in it. Because it was common sense to write it that way, as the obvious way to improve the story of Unleashed. And if he had heard any criticism of his reboot, and wanted to make it better, he should have known better than to include the most infamous padding in Sonic just because it was in the game. Why have a game adaptation if you don't even care about it? Because you don't want to wrap it up already. It's extending a plot that couldn't take longer than a day to watch all of its cutscenes to last an arc that took three years to all come out. You don't have to include the most hated thing ever just to be faithful. It's like if he wrote a Sonic 06 adaptation and kept the romance between Sonic and Elise. The old man says that through the magical Gaia Gate, the heroes can access the central chambers of the seven temples from the spot. Really? Without having to go to the other temples first? That's suspiciously good pacing. Logically, that means they'd be able to get all the Sun and Moon keys in just a couple issues. And I hate that after Antoine says that's good, Sonic angrily tells him to knock it off. Yeah, knock off being a good audience surrogate. Antoine says they won't have to worry about the Egg Army sneaking in after they access the temple. Again, what makes them think they won't be able to do that with their superior technology? They could get in with a tank. And Sonic lampshades that Chip and Antoine are stating the obvious. But I'd rather the writer have not written the characters to state the obvious at all if he was aware of it. All this did was waste panels on a story that's already unbearably boring and slow as it is. All it did was give us more to read. I was hoping it'd actually be interesting. You don't want your audience to lose interest and have their hype die not even halfway into the issue. Well, it was good of Sonic to say he's glad the old man wasn't hurt. Oh, as if things weren't confusing convoluted enough. This old man is the only one who knew about the Gaia Gate and the identities of all the key holders. Are you serious? I naturally assumed every Gaia Garden was like that. So, has nobody ever used the temples in the Gaia Gate before, which would reveal this immediately? Wouldn't the teleporters make illegal immigration really easy if someone could access them? I guess people would make an exception for the heroes trying to fix the world, though. Who would be the only people who'd go into the Gaia Gate. The old man says that he's fortunately written down the names and locations of the key holders. Locations? That's good. It makes sense for him to include photos of what they look like too, so Sonic would instantly be able to find them on site, not have to go to a location and ask every single person there what their name is. If logic was there, Sonic would be able to find all these key holders really quickly because he has super speed and access to the teleporters, so that'd be great pacing. And Sonic turns into the Werehog, and Antoine says that not only does that startle him, but apparently the Werehog has a musky smell too. Sonic says he'll be glad when he stops turning into a Werehog and the nightly monster attacks are done. Even the characters in the comic are tired of the Unleashed Dark. The heroes destroy some badniks, I mean equally harmless monsters. And then they get surprised by a giant titan monster. Sonic's actually smart enough to tell Chip to call Rhoda for backup on the tablet, rather than assuming he can beat the titan himself. He's even got Antoine for backup, which the werehog in the game didn't have. They're taking this monster way too seriously after all their experience. It's not like they're underwater this time. But at least they're being afraid of it gets me a bit more invested because it's a threat to everybody else. I like that Sonic picked up Antoine to save him as the giant club smacked into one of the monsters for them. That's one of the only original things about the story that tries to wake me up. 
People already saw Sonic fighting monsters in a town in the game if they used Jeff's camera to unpossess people there. Sonic tells Antoine to keep the smaller monsters off his back, and then, I guess because they were called for backup thanks to Chip, Knuckles, Amy, and Bunny suddenly show up to attack the Titan because they're apparently close by the whole time. It just, I would picture the Sky Patrol to be way higher than that. And Knuckles frustratingly wastes my time recapping the last time he saw a Titan instead of him at least punching the Titan the whole time, making himself useful. While well, it was a nice moment that when Sonic likes the idea of punching the Titan a lot, Knuckles says he likes this version of him. Of course he would. I know there's no tension at all and none of the heroes will even get injured, so I'm just bored by this long drawn out fight. Oh, I like that one of the Master Emerald Shards is with the Titan. That progresses Knuckles' plot that never needed to happen. But if the fight with the Titan was going to be this uninteresting, then wow, that was boring. It does make sense to have it take a lot of hits to defeat, because video game. And I'd much rather have this be what lengthens an issue than anything else, because at least it's fighting. That's the best kind of padding. Antoine says he must be crazy as he runs up to the monster and attacks it to get the shard out of it. He's fought tons of robots and the monster is being held still by Sonic. What's crazy about this as opposed to fighting badniks? Ugh, finally the Titan's destroyed. That was boring. Amy says to Knuckles, nice work, and this almost makes up for the tournament. And Knuckles lampshades that he thought Amy was ready. Really? Even though she clearly had her back to him and wasn't paying attention? He tells her to stop making him the bad guy. Why was this written? I thought her grudge against him would be done by now. They had to fight in the tournament. They weren't told they could forfeit any time. She didn't instantly forfeit in front of him. It's so childish of Amy to want revenge on Knuckles for doing what he had to do. This is why I can't take Amy seriously as a level-headed neck. At least Knuckles looks sympathetic here. It's always good to have clear moments that prove that Knuckles really cares about Amy and Sonic as friends, because those don't happen nearly often enough. And then the boring plot is padded out some more because we have to see Chip recap to the other heroes what they missed when Sonic was in the temple. Couldn't we have cut past this and just assume the heroes got told about this off screen? It's not like the writer didn't have enough story ideas to properly fill up an issue, because it's just using a story that someone else wrote as a foundation. So there's absolutely no excuse for Sonic staying with his friends and blabbing their ears off about this. He could leave the recapping to Chip. Flynn could have easily written Sonic to just go to Missouri at this point. To be fair, he's slowed down by being in his werehog form right now. But that didn't need to be written. And that doesn't matter, he's got the Gaia Gate. He would have just run to all its teleporters and started searching for people while Chip would be recapping to Amy for him. All Sonic having more people to talk to than Chip does is slow things down. It was good to see some more variety in how the monsters were getting hit because more people were fighting them. But that clearly wasn't worth all this padding. We could have assumed they'd be fighting the monsters like this if they had to deal with them. Amy says they don't have to divide their attention because she can go with Knuckles until she'll find the shards and restore Angel Island. It's sweet of her to go treasure hunting with Knuckles for once instead of him always having to do it alone. It's sweet of her to say she'll keep Knuckles safe for once, even though everyone knows Knuckles is the stronger one. And while it immediately struck me as weird that Sonic was upset about Amy leaving him, it was kind of sweet. It must be because he values her companionship in the reboot because she's not flirting with him all the time or being mean. Because he should know he doesn't need her anymore with the guy he gate around. Well, until they want to look for the emeralds. It's also sweet that nobody immediately corrects Amy, that if anything, Knuckles would be keeping her safe. Since when has Knuckles ever gotten kidnapped? Well, aside from Archie one time. Cream says that she doesn't want to be pushy, being relatable. Then asks when she gets to go on missions. Wait, she's never gone on a mission before? Are you serious? I thought she was with them for years. Rhoda says she'll go on missions when they don't involve monsters. So was she literally just hired on the team right before the monsters showed up? That was pointless to write. At least it tries to explain why she hasn't gone on a mission better, but still, this is a writer who dislikes Sad AM. You'd think he'd know better than to repeat one of its biggest problems like it's nothing. If you dislike something, wouldn't you be all the more motivated to avoid all of its problems at all costs? It's not any better just because it's Cream in that position instead of Tails. Because she can fly too. It still makes the heroes look like idiots every single time. If they don't want it to get hurt, and that's why, 
Then I'm left wondering why they aren't just upright with her immediately and telling her that all they want her to do is stuff that doesn't put her in danger. AKA, she's just here to serve them tea. It's so patronizing to her, they're just calling her a freedom fighter to humor her. I'm glad she's finally mad about this, but realistically this would lead to her quitting the team. Tails and Archie took a lot longer to get annoyed about being babied. So, realistically, she would get fed up with it much earlier than Tails did. Then Rouge calls Rotor in the Sky Patrol, and I like that she says it pains her to give up the lead on any treasure. It makes me appreciate the fact that she's telling him that even more. Like, she knows they need the emerald more than ever now. She says that a gun unit found an emerald in a crystal desert zone. Now I'm wishing that the monster was fought in that place, an original setting, and Apatos was shown as little as possible. Then Orbot tells Eggman that Metal Sonic is online. Oh, so as if we didn't have enough arbitrary padding, we're gonna see a villain scene too! Villain scenes are worth it when the characters are entertaining enough that you perk up just at seeing them. Regardless of how evil you know they are. Like Blaine and Donnie and iZombie. Those are villain scenes that work. Eggman is the most boring character ever here. The whole time I was reading Reboot, I was just missing Boom Eggman. Eggman says to give Metal Sonic clearance for whatever he's doing. And out of nowhere, we see his Eggmobile flying towards the Lost Hex, and he says he's in the middle of a hostile takeover, and Metal Soul to engage. The Lost World prequel story is issue 9 of Sonic Super Special Magazine, and Sonic had referenced issue 14 as if it just happened earlier in this very issue. I guess this isn't the first time Eggman's gone after Lost Hex to invade it. I'm saying this because it's just confusing because he's talking as if this is the first time he's ever tried to do a hostile takeover of the Lost Hex. It's confusing because I'd expect Flint to do what he normally does, where he has the game supposedly be canon to the comic. Lost World can't be literally canon to the comic. If this is the first time he's ever going to the Lost Hex, and it's going to lead to a completely different plot from the game. So with that, the boring story by Ian Flynn is finally over. There is no excuse for having so much boring padding when almost nothing new and interesting is happening. Sonic goes to the Guy Temple of Apatos and defeats a monster. Surprisingly, all that happens before he goes to the temple is that he fights robots. While I love that the heroes can apparently go to any Guy Temple from the Guy Gate of Apatos, that doesn't make up for the absolute bullshit that they need to find all the Sun and Moon keys too. This is the definition of moving the goalposts. You'd think even he would have been sick of Unleashed at this point, and he should have known everyone hated the Sun and Moon medals for this very reason. Why would the Guardians want to do anything that would delay the planet being brought back together? They would just have all the chambers unlocked to start with, the idiots. If it's supposed to make sense that the Gaia Guardians are being kept secret because they're vital and necessary, well, you don't see firemen being kept a secret. You don't see the identities of paramedics being kept a secret from everybody. The Titan fight was extremely boring and drawn out. Because we know that the heroes are going to be fine. It's not like they showed any interesting new powers or anything. If nothing interesting was going to happen in that fight, it shouldn't have existed because we got nothing out of it. There's no excuse for having to turn night just to pad things out. There's no excuse for Sonic not just going to another temple in this issue. I'm sure if all that padding was removed, we could have had the convict space for Sonic to go to a bunch of other temples and get the keys. The overall plot was basic, and because it was so similar to a plot I've already seen, it was agonizingly boring from the lack of creativity and slow pacing. There were a few moments I liked that I pointed out, but that's the case for every story, so obviously that's not enough to make a story good. I came into this knowing that it wasn't going to be the most original thing in the world, because now they're finally getting to the Unleashed plot itself. But I still was excited, specifically for that reason, because they're finally pushing through this. Considering it wasn't going to be original, there is no excuse for not having the pacing be as fast as logically possible. Because, obviously the audience already knows the story you're going to tell. So you should be expecting them to be bored. Copying another story is already going to make it boring. So a slow pacing on top of that makes things go from dull to agonizing. Which makes me impatient every time I'm slowed down and getting through the story by some problem I have to discuss. So that everything is just all the more frustrating because of the boredom. The story ends right when it gets a little interesting. 
when Metal Sonic's about to go after the emerald that Rouge talked about. Because at least that's original. So this should have been most of the story. 